audio. We're very lucky to have Marco Salemi speaking to us today. Marco is well known for his work in molecular epidemiology, intra-host virus evolution, and the application of phylogenetic and population genetic methods to the study of human and simian pathogenic viruses. He was a Marie Curie Fellow at the Reagan Institute and the Catholic University of Leuven for his PhD, did postdoctoral work with Walter Fitch at UC Irvine, he's currently at the University of Florida. Um, so we're going to get started, and you can see that today we have our very first live audience, it's not just me, and I'm very excited about that. So we'll hear uh, Marco today talking about the phylogenetic challenges in the retroviridae branch of the tree of life. Take it away, Marco. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, so, well, uh, first of all, um, I would like really to thank you, Eric, to inviting me this, to, do, to give you this seminar. This is really a, a great opportunity. And, um, and as uh, Eric just said, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, uh, phylogenetic challenges in the retroviridae branch of the tree of life. Essentially, um, we're going to discuss about virus evolution, virus taxonomy, and the peculiar problems that uh, arise when we investigate the molecular evolution of, uh, of fast evolving viruses and retroviruses, and RNA viruses in particular, and the special challenges that they, are, that they pose in order to integrate them within, you know, uh, with the, the general tree of life. So let me tell you a little bit what we know right now uh, about uh, um, viral taxonomy. Um, so this is actually, this slide is uh, from the uh, viral taxonomy, virus taxonomy web page, it's the 2009 release. And uh, so far, um, retroviruses, viruses have been uh, basically uh, um, organized and classified, I would say, five different orders. Uh, 22 different families, uh, uh, each one is um, eventually divided in 39 genera and 476 different species. Um, and there are also, in fact, uh, uh, 65 family, 81 genera, and uh, more than 1,700 species that have not been, in fact, so far assigned uh, to any specific uh, order. So basically, we really know very little right now about viral classification and viral classification and viral taxonomy. In fact, uh, we know uh, today, well, I mean, some estimates about the number of species that there are on planet Earth. Some estimates say that there are about probably about 2 million. Some other estimates say up to 20 million different species, species uh, um, on Earth. So if we assume that there are at least as many viral species as bacterial ones, and uh, are, well, we probably might have mapped so far no more than 0.1% or less of all viruses. So obviously, whatever we, whatever we know about the distribution of viruses on this planet today is extremely little. and uh, the picture that we have is extremely partial. This is also due in, in, in the inherent bias that I have is that uh, viruses are um, mostly studied because they are important pathogens. They can be animal pathogens and important plant pathogens as well. So obviously, our the research that has been carried over in the in the past you know uh, 50 years of molecular evolution on viruses have been really mostly focused, and even before that, on pathogenic uh, species. Uh, but definitely, I think it's safe to say that so far we have barely scratched the surface of what uh, viral diversity is on our planet. Now, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, can you see me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's my microphone. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so basically, uh, the main message uh, right now that I'd like to give is, uh, in fact, as much as we know about uh, viral evolution and viral classification, we can easily uh, look at the databases, molecular databases right now, and 
and see that there are hundreds of thousands of viral sequences deposited. And there is entirely, today we have an entirely database dedicated just for HIV, the HIV Los Alamos databases, uh, that contains probably around 80,000, probably even more sequences of HIV. So there is, in fact, an enormous amount of data out there. And still, in terms of actual mapping viral diversity, we are probably barely scratching the, the surface. Now, why do we care, actually, about uh, having um, a general idea of how many viruses and uh, the distribution of viruses on our planet. Because as I said, viruses, are, uh, a lot of viruses and a lot of the viruses that we study actually are associated or can be potentially associated with severe uh, diseases. And in the, especially in the, past, in the past 30 years, we have seen all around the world and um, in developing as well as in Western country, the reemergent uh, or the emergence of a lot of new uh, pathogenic viruses. HIV infection is probably the paradigmatic example, um, a, a virus that in fact was unknown until the beginning of the 80s. It was in fact the first uh, human retrovirus, uh, a virus with an RNA genome that is uh, retrotranscribed during the virus life cycle into double-stranded DNA uh, uh, and inserted inside the host cell genome. Uh, a virus that was unknown until the beginning of the 80s and three decades later is responsible for one of the fastest uh, um, growing epidemic in the history of mankind. Same thing for hepatitis C. Right now, there is an estimate that there are almost 280 million people infected with hepatitis C virus. HCV was actually isolated in 1989. So again, and then of course, uh, things like West Nile virus, for example, a virus that historically has been usually uh, localized in um, in, in Africa, in, uh, in Eastern and Central Africa, and that, in fact, just uh, uh, 20 years ago was introduced in the United States and in the next 20 years has spread all over the United States and now has been uh, also, um, has reached also countries like Central American countries, Mexico, Latin America, so it definitely has been uh, rapidly spreading also in the um, American continent. And again, this is not, uh, these are just a few examples, this map, is giving you an idea of the major uh, retroviral emerging infections we have been dealing with in the last 30 years. Uh, H1N1, for example, the, uh, the swine flu is the most recent example. So obviously viruses are, um, have, a, have a fundamental uh, interest in terms of healthcare and, uh, and epidemiology worldwide. They are also very interesting objects to study from the point of view of molecular evolution because um, especially the retroviruses, and my talk will be today specifically focused on retroviruses, viruses that belong to the so-called retroviride family, um, they have a really peculiar uh, molecular biology. They are double-stranded RNA uh, viruses. They actually have a, a single, the, the genome is a, a single-strand RNA genome, but they are actually uh, diploids. Each variant contains two copies of RNA. They have a unique replication cycle, as I said, that is mediated by the uh, RNA-dependent reverse transcriptase. Uh, and uh, they can actually, they are pretty ubiquitous in nature. They can be isolated from most vertebrate species. Uh, they are associated, of course, with significant human and, and animal diseases. And they have also limited homology with the retrotransposons that are endogenous retroviruses. Um, and uh, these viruses as actually um, a very interesting uh, um, evolutionary feature. They actually replicate extremely fast, especially HIV, uh, and they mutate very fast. The reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that has no error prone, uh, that is error prone, that has no proofreading activity. For HIV, for example, it's been calculated that there is on average at least one mutation per every, per genome, per replication cycle. They're very small genomes, usually no more than nine, ten thousand 10,000 base pairs, uh, but they can accumulate mutations extremely fast. Um, so in a way, from the point of view of the evolutionary biologist, they are extremely interesting objects to study because they allow us to literally see evolution happening in a matter of months or years, and they can be excellent objects to test uh, evolution, evolution at the molecular level. So for all these many reasons, actually, they are an interesting object of study. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about the retroviride family, uh, which is the main topic of this uh, um, conversation. And uh, uh, try to figure out, and what I'm going to show you 
that in fact uh, 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 retroviruses, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, they have a um, similar genome organization and uh, um, uh, they can actually behave depending on the on the family, on the order, the subfamily, they can actually um, behave in wildly different ways from the point of view of molecular evolution. And it's not really uh, easy, and we will see, not at all clear, how we can actually um, basically uh, uh, study the, uh, and obtain a general phylogenetic tree related to all retroviruses. Now, this classification here that is, uh, again, taken by the ICTB website of 2009, the International Committee for uh, Taxonomy in Virology, uh, classified, uh, I mean, classified a family called retroviridae, which are, in fact, viruses with an RNA genome characterized by the reverse transcriptase and by the cycle of reverse transcription and uh, in a double-stranded DNA insertion in this uh, whole cell genome. And the retroviridae family is uh, actually divided in two subfamilies, the orthoretrovirine and the uh, spuma retrovirine. The orthoretrovirine has actually divided, subdivided the subfamily in uh, seven different genera. And in particular, uh, we will focus on two of these uh, different genera, the delta retroviruses. This is the genus that includes uh, different species like PTLV1, PTLV2, PTLV3, and BLV. The PTLV are the primate T lymphotropic uh, viruses and uh, are infecting uh, primates in old, uh, in, uh, old world monkeys, in new world monkeys as well. Uh, sorry is in Africa and in Asia, as well as human. Uh, BLV is the bovine leukemia virus. Um, the lentivirus genus is the one instead that includes uh, HIV-1, HIV-2, so the immunodeficiency viruses, as well the simian immunodeficiency virus. And finally, uh, the Spuma virina uh, subfamily uh, so far only has one genus, uh, and this includes several species, uh, among which as SFB, which is the simian family virus, BFB, that is the bovine family virus, and so forth. So, um, what I'm going to do in the, with the next few slides is to talk a little bit about what we know about the evolution and phylogeny of actually uh, delta viruses, and especially, and especially PTLVs, what we know about lentivirus, what we know about spuma virus, and in particular, simian family virus, and, uh, and show you how essentially uh, these viruses not only evolve with very different uh, uh, biological mechanisms, but also at completely different time scales, and actually integrate all of them in one single phylogenetic tree is not at all a trivial matter. So uh, this is just a um, classic retroviral genome. Each retrovirus, uh, each uh, member of the retrovirus family uh, has the same uh, um, genome. Sorry. And it includes actually a gene for uh, GAG, the capsid proteins, the pole gene for the uh, polymerase and integrase, which include the RT gene, the AMP, which encode for the envelope proteins, and usually there is a region PX that codes for uh, non structural proteins that often in many of these retroviruses can have regulatory, um, um, can, can, can work as regulatory proteins. Uh, the single-stranded RNA has a two unique repeat, uh, uh, and identical repeats at the five prime end and at the uh, three prime end. And when the single-stranded uh, RNA is retrotranscribed by DRT in double-stranded DNA, we'll have at the beginning of the end two identical LTR, long terminal repeat, with a U3, an R, and a U5 uh, region. Uh, I already said that, uh, in fact, the main feature, biologically speaking, of retroviruses is the ability to infect the host cell and retrotranscribe double-stranded DNA in double-stranded DNA, the genome that eventually is inserted by a specific uh, virus encoded, viral encoded uh, integrase into the um, DNA genome, and eventually the virus is expressed, gives rise to new uh, genomes, uh, new variants are assembled, usually in the cytoplasm, and eventually butted out from the cell so that they can infect new cells. This is common to all the families and subfamilies, uh, all the subfamilies and uh, species, gene, genera, and species of retroviruses. However, when we start looking more in detail about their, uh, like, evolutionary um, uh, uh, 
history and common history and phylogenetic history, then you know, we uh, encounter uh, several specific problems. Now, this is a general cladogram, really, that kind of depict in, in phylogenetic terms uh, the taxonomy of the major, of some of the major uh, species in the Squamavirina and Orthovirina family. Uh, this actually uh, phylogenetic tree has been obtained, this genealogy really has been obtained by comparing RT protein, the reverse transcriptase is the only one that has enough actually homology uh, to compare uh, viruses belonging to actually, retroviruses belonging to different genera. And uh, as you can see, the one in yellow here are the ones that we will specifically discuss in, um, in the next few slides, uh, SFV, which is the simian foami virus uh, belonging to the Spuma retrovirina subfamily, the HIV-1 and HIV-2 and their simian counterpart, the SIV, the immunodeficiency and simian immunode human immunodeficiency, simian immunodeficiency viruses, and the uh, PTLD, the primate telanthropic viruses that include both human T cell and simian T cell lipotropic viruses, each one of them, of course, belonging to different um, very different clades in the phylogenetic reconstruction. Now, uh, this tree actually here is actually quite misleading because when we go into the details and we look at the evolutionary history of these viruses, we can immediately realize that actually we're talking, for example, first of all, of a completely and very different temporal time scale. Uh, first of all, what is the first problem in trying to obtain a general you know, phylogenetic uh, classification of these viruses? The, the, the first problem is the low homology. Now, these are um, dot plots, basically plots that uh, compare uh, in a sliding window fashion uh, different genomes at the amino acid level. Uh, here on the left, it has dot plots that comparing as an SIB, typical SIB genome with HIV-1. Uh, the segments on the diagonal represent regions where there is at least 65% uh, uh, or more uh, amino acid similarity in a window of uh, 10 amino acids uh, that is slide along the entire genome. Uh, actually, in this case, along the entire polymerase gene, the reverse transcriptase gene, the one encoding for the reverse transcriptase in these two um, viral uh, viruses. And as you can see, there are just a few regions that have enough similarity and that can be considered truly homologous. And usually these uh, three, actually four major segments along the diagonal are the ones that usually are con concatenated together to obtain the tree that you have seen in the previous slide. When you start comparing something like HIV-1 and the simian formivirus, still RT gene, so now we're looking at two retroviruses from two different, actually, uh, subfamilies, then you basically see that there is almost no uh, uh, significant similarity. So in the moment we even try to, and this is the most conserved gene, in, in, in these viruses. Uh, so already this uh, can tell us that obtaining a tree like this that is truly reliable is not really easy because of the law homology when we start comparing uh, viruses uh, belonging to really different, uh, retroviruses belonging to really different families and subfamilies. The second major problem that we have uh, when we try actually to come up with a general phylogeny of retroviruses is, as I said, wildly uh, different evolutionary time scale in the uh, phylogenetic tree. Uh, we will show in, um, in a few slides that actually uh, the origin of simian foami viruses is uh, probably, dates back probably several million years ago and probably they share a common ancestor with the bovine feline virus, uh, foami virus, which is another virus of the same subfamily as long as 80 million years ago. So this part of the tree, for example, is extremely old. Um, here in this slide, I put that the, the putative origin of actually HIV-1 and SIV, the common ancestor, is about 2,500 years ago. Unfortunately, I prepared these slides uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and just uh, uh, two or three days ago, I guess, uh, there was a paper published uh, um, in uh, uh, Science, I believe. Uh, I don't know if it's Science or important paper from uh, Mike Warroby, who actually has uh, recalibrated uh, in an accurate way the molecular clock to find out the common ancestor, the time of the most recent common ancestor for HIV and SIV, and in fact he calculated this, that this ancestor could have existed as long as 130,000 years ago. So clearly we are talking about 
about uh, at, a, at a date that is much older than the one that I put here on my slide, but it's definitely much, much younger if compared to the time, temporal time scale of simian foami viruses. When we talk about primate T lymphotropic viruses, belonging again to a different uh, genus, um, now we are talking about a revolution which had its uh, most recent common ancestor for all the PTLDs probably around 400,000 years ago. So again, you know, very different time scale, a little bit probably older than the HIV and SIV, definitely much younger than the uh, FOAMI virus. So clearly, uh, this different, uh, wildly different time scale represent a serious problem when we try to obtain a general, a general phylogeny of these uh, viruses, represent them in one single phylogenetic tree and resolve their phylogeny uh, because they have wildly different molecular clocks. And that's actually what this slide is all about. It's a sort of schematic representation of the different evolutionary rates uh, that this virus exhibit. Now, HIV, SAV, and notably, I will talk about this um, later in more detail, HTLB2, uh, uh, that is actually spreading in injecting drug users, this is what IBUs stands for, usually have evolution rates between 10 and minus 3 and 10 and minus 4 nucleotide substitution per site per year. So HIV and SAV are actually considered among the fastest uh, um, evolving um, organisms that uh, we know about on our planet. Now, when we look at uh, primate lymphotropic viruses uh, like PTLB1 and PTLB2, uh, the rate is actually much slower. It's around 10 at minus 6, uh, sometimes even up to 10 at minus 7, nucleotide substitution per site per year. What is interesting here is that, again, HTLB2. HTLB2 is the human T cell lymphotropic virus type 2 that uh, can be actually found in two different populations right now. One is uh, uh, the virus is endemically infecting um, Native American tribes, especially in uh, um, South uh, United States and Southern America, and also some isolated pygmy tribes in Africa. But HTLB2 also can be found at a very high seroprevalence in injected drug users, uh, uh, most of which are co-infected with HIV. Now, one thing that is interesting and that we will discuss further is that actually the same virus uh, that is being um, uh, spreading in two different populations exhibit two widely different rate of evolution, whether it's infecting drug users and endemic tribes. We will see uh, uh, that this actually has an interesting explanation that has to do with, uh, uh, with uh, the link of uh, and the um, correlation between and, and relationship between evolution rate and actually uh, transmission rate. Um, simian foami viruses actually uh, exhibit even uh, slower uh, evolution rate, around 10 at minus 8, almost similar to the ones of mitochondrial DNA. So as you can see, all of them are retroviruses, RNA genome with uh, reverse transcriptase mediated replication of the genetic information, but wildly different evolution rates. And part of our talk will be about investigating why this is so. And of course, this is already makes very interesting this kind of uh, objects. So the evolution dynamics of these viruses are also very different, which also in part uh, uh, explains why they have such different evolution rates. Um, Simian foamy viruses are usually characterized by low replication rate. They infect a host and uh, almost immediately after infection, they stop replicating within the host and become essentially dormant. Uh, and they are essentially characterized throughout their evolutionary history by host virus co speciation. I show some. Uh, uh, real studies that demonstrate at this point. They seem to co-speciate along with the uh, uh, um, simian host that they infect. Now, viruses like uh, the simian T lymphotropic viruses, uh, or in general the primate T lymphotropic viruses, instead are characterized by some sort of, what we say, it's a little bit qualitative, but medium replication rate. Uh, and mostly they get transmitted by as uh, horizontal gene transfer. Uh, usually, for example, HTLBs, human T cell lymphotropic viruses, the ones infecting um, the, uh, the injecting drug users are transmitted, for example, by blood to blood contact uh, through needle sharing between drug users. Uh, sometimes can also be transmitted vertically, like for example, HTLB in endemic tribes, where the, the main route of infection is actually from mother to child through breastfeeding. And finally, and both 
SFD and STLD essentially do not recombine. There are no uh, cases that be reported of recombination events uh, among STLDs or among uh, simian polyviruses. HIV and SIV, on the other hand, are characterized by extremely high replication rate. HIV infecting a host can replicate, you know, every uh, two, three days in, in the infected host. By frequent recombination, HIV and SIV are highly recombinogenic and, of course, as we have seen, a uh, very fast evolutionary rate. So, let me now show you um, a few specific examples from uh, uh, the literature about what we have learned over the past uh, 10 years on the evolution of these viruses. And let's start from uh, the simian formid viruses, which are the, the slowest evolving retroviruses that we know. Um, and uh, this is basically uh, a paper that has shown a few years back how actually these SFD have been co-speciating with their host. Now, the concept of co-speciation essentially is the concept of a, a, a parasite infecting a host. And the idea is that in case of co-speciation, you have a phylogeny that represents, of course, the evolution of relationships uh, uh, among different host species, that are, each one is infected by a parasite. And when we compare the host phylogeny with the parasite phylogeny, uh, in case of co-speciation, one of the scenarios that we can see is that the trees have the same topology. Same topologies, but like in this case, different branch lengths basically say that every time that during evolution, there is a split, a divergence between two different lineages in the host, the same happens to the parasite phylogeny. Um, we can have, this is a, a form of co-speciation that uh, uh, we can call maybe a topological co-speciation. Now, there is a, a stronger form of co-speciation where not only the trees share the same topologies, but also share the same time of speciation, which basically means that uh, not only, in fact, that the, the parasite tend to uh, uh, speciate and, and, and give rise to new lineages at the, um, when the host gives rise to uh, splits in, in two lineages, uh, uh, but these events pretty much happens almost uh, simultaneously. And finally, we have the strongest way of, uh, the strongest possible cospecision scenario in which uh, the trees of the host and the parasites show both the same topology, the same specision time, and the same rates of evolution. So literally, host and parasites are evolving in a very similar and correlated way. Now, there are, uh, the only example that before the work with semen forming virus uh, was uh, shown clearly in the literature about co-speciation with uh, the phylogeny of lice and gophers that clearly show some evidence of uh, um, topological co-speciation where the host and parasites uh, seems to have uh, congruent phylogenies. Uh, we will see actually that uh, simian foami viruses not only have the, a very strong kind of co-speciation where both the topology, the decision times, and the rates of evolution in the SFD phylogeny and the uh, uh, simian phylogeny are actually very much the same. Um, so I will skip this for the moment, and I'll give you some of the results. Uh, essentially, the work started as a collaboration with uh, um, the Center for Disease Control, uh, they have actually sampled uh, a number of uh, um, simian foami viruses from a lot of different monkey species, uh, from baboon to mandrill to mangabee, follow beam spider monkeys, and even from a different apes. And each one of these species, or almost uh, each one of them, uh, they also isolated the uh, corresponding simian foami virus. So we had a task that, that included uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences in this uh, specific study, the cytochrome oxidases 2 was used, uh, was sequenced for the mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA sequences from each one of the animals from all these different species. And correspondingly, from the same animals, we also obtained um, sequences from the integrase gene of uh, SFD of the specific simian uh, formivirus strain that was infected those, uh, was infected those monkeys. So uh, this is one of the uh, uh, on the left hand side here is the, um, uh, the uh, simian phylogeny. On the right hand side is actually the viral phylogeny. I hope I'm, yes. And, uh, and basically, 
uh, the, the trees were superimposed in order to check whether there was congruence between speciation events in the one phylogeny and speciation and events in the other phylogeny and a specific uh, randomization test was uh, in, in this particular in comparing these two trees uh, at least 24 co-speciation events were observed and a randomization test was performed to see whether these events could ever um, could could have been the results of just you know uh, randomness and basically the test is fairly simple basically what you do is that you randomize the the name on the tips of both the parasite and the host uh, phylogeny and then again you count and you do this randomization 10,000 times and you count and then you superimpose the trees a couple of trees for each randomization and uh, you count number of possible co-speciation uh, so this one is actually the uh, the distribution the normal distribution that results is actually the distribution of number of speciation events observed in the 10,000 pairs of randomized trees and uh, the ones observed actually 24 in our two uh, actual phylogenies were significantly higher than what we would expect to observe just by randomness. The p-value was uh, obviously highly uh, significant. So definitely there is co-speciation ongoing, so uh, there is uh, topological co-speciation. There is also a, a very strong correlation between uh, the, the host and the parasite branch lengths. These are the way uh, the simian virus uh, phylogeny uh, the branch lengths in SFP phylogeny integrates are correlated uh, to the primate ones uh, when we consider uh, lineages that share the same common ancestor in both uh, and that have the same topology in both phylogenies. So it seems that also uh, not just the uh, um, not just the topology, but also that the rate of evolution seems to be um, seems to be similar in. Uh, uh, both the mitochondrial DNA and the simian foliar viruses infecting these monkeys. And finally, we estimated um, evolutionary rates, both for the SFP3 and, uh, and a specific evolution rate for the simian foliar virus tree and from the uh, primate tree and tried to put an evolutionary time scale on these trees. How did we calibrate the time scale on these two trees? Well, uh, in our data set, we had essentially two main um, families of monkey, the old world monkeys and actually the new world monkeys and by um, several uh, paleontological and archaeological data it is known and pretty much accepted that the separation between these two big families occurred about 30 million years ago. The same split between old world monkeys and uh, and actually sorry apes here I should have said that happened 30 million years ago. Apes includes gibbons, orang, and of course, African apes and, and humans. So the split between old world monkeys and apes that occurred 30 million years ago, this deep split in the primates phylogeny is also present in the simian foliar virus phylogeny. In other words, viruses uh, that are isolated from uh, these um, animals uh, cluster monophyletically and they are clearly separated from the viruses, uh, sequenced from the apes. So, we basically used, uh, because there was this perfect conference in the phylogeny, 30 million years in the phylogeny to both calibrate the molecular clock of the monkey virus and uh, the simian foami virus. And the result was actually pretty interesting uh, because we did find, in fact, that by calibrating the evolution rate in this way, uh, the substitution rate of uh, simian foamy viruses was about uh, 1.7, 1.8, 10 at minus 8, which is definitely the slowest of all the retroviruses we know. Uh, it's about the same rate of uh, mitochondrial DNA and uh, still slower, still, sorry, faster than endogenous retroviruses, but definitely uh, several order of magnitudes slower retroviruses or in general RNA viruses. In fact, even slower than DNA viruses like polyoma and carpet singlets. Mitochondrial DNA, autochromous oxidases rate, as you can see, was pretty much the same. So definitely a case of co-speciation that is topological at the level of evolution rates and at the level of speciation time. When we started looking at uh, um, uh, time of most recent common ancestor for the major splits in the 
actinium folivirus 3 and monochrome oxidase 3, for example, the most recent common ancestor of the circopia, both in the monkey trees, in the simian trees, and in the tree that includes the folivirus uh, isolated from circopia, they actually ended up, the estimates were pretty similar. Um, in order to do to carry over this calculation, we used a, um, a relaxed, actually, a sort of relaxed molecular clock. We use a method uh, called RATES uh, that has been developed by uh, Sanderson and that uh, um, take into account the fact that uh, rates along different uh, branches of the tree might be different, although they are correlated so that uh, um, lineages that are closer in the tree usually are much more similar rates than lineages that are more distant in phylogenetic trees. Um, and as you can see, for example, the split between the pan, which are the monocots and the chimpanzees and gorilla, is estimated in the mitochondrial DNA tree between 8 and 12 million years ago. Uh, pan and gorilla also share, uh, but the viruses, as a semen from the viruses infecting pan and gorilla, also share a common ancestor, and their common ancestor was also estimated between 9.8 and 10.8 million years ago. So definitely, semen from viruses are a great example of a virus that has been uh, replicated, that has been evolving very slowly, co-evolving with its host uh, pretty much at the same rate. How do we explain the low substitution rates that really favor co-specification in simian foami viruses? I mean, this is still a retrovirus, of course. It's still a virus with an RNA genome, in which uh, replication is mediated uh, the error-prone reverse transcriptase. Well, the main way, actually, the main mechanism is, as I said at the very beginning, the extremely low rates of active replication uh, in an infected host, uh, basically, uh, um, except for a few replication cycles right after infection, uh, SFV does not replicate. In fact, there is even uh, evidence uh, from molecular biology that as soon as SFV infect the new host, there is induction, induction of cellular genes that, uh, like interferon, that actively reduce um, viral expression. And also, and this was shown also in the, in the paper in 2005, there is a very strong purifying selection in the internal branches with the number of synonymous substitution uh, much higher, extremely uh, significantly higher than the one of uh, uh, non-synonymous substitutions. And again, this of course is a force that tend to uh, maintain um, a really low overall actually evolutionary rate. So, What happens when we try to look at the evolution and evolution time scale, for example, of HDLB and STLB? Now we are looking at a different uh, uh, genus and a different part of the retrovirida uh, um, tree of life. Um, as this was uh, work that the work I'm going to show actually has been done more than 10 years ago. It was actually at the time part of my uh, PhD thesis. And, uh, and essentially several papers that basically investigated uh, really the, the tempo and mode of HTLB and STLB evolution. And, um, and again, we find here some very interesting patterns, definitely very, very different from the one we observed, observed for simian family viruses. Uh, first of all, um, let me tell you something about HTLB epidemiology just to set up the ground here. Um, HTLV1 and HTLV2, which are the main uh, types of human T cell lipotropic viruses, are mm, pretty much uh, widely distributed. Uh, there are about 22 million people uh, infected by HTLV1. Uh, HTLV2 also infects several million people, although there are no precise estimates right now. Um, each one of these two viruses has senior counterparts called senior T lipotropic virus type 1 and type 2, and collectively are known as. PTLV, primary telepotropic viruses. Uh, new HTLV2 have been found also in uh, Cameroonian primate hunters. Uh, um, there is a type that is called HTLV3 that so far has been only found in four, as I learned from four, four different people. And there's an HTLV4, uh, only one case known. We do call it HTLV4 because as I'll show you in a second, uh, it's a very divergent lineage, very different from HTLV1 and HTLV2 and 3. Um, transmissibility similar to HIV, 
uh, mostly is either to blood transfusion or intravenous drug use, people sharing needles, and uh, infected blood can eff efficiently transmit HDLD to a new uh, host. Um, there is some sexual transmission, but actually it's not incredibly efficient. HDLD, uh, on the other hand, can be very efficiently transmitted from mother to child, primarily by breastfeeding. Um, HDLD1 and 2 are also associated with specific disease, uh, acute cell leukemia lymphoma, and tropical spastic paraparesis, which is a neurological disorder for HTLV1, and HTLV2 is also associated with uh, um, uh, lymphoma-like and uh, neurological-like symptoms and illnesses. Uh, it's not clear if HTLV3 and HTLV4 can actually give diseases. Now, so they are pathogenic, at least HTLV1 and HTLV2 are pathogenic. One important difference to keep in mind, and we will see at the end that this is probably an uh, an important thing uh, for uh, understanding really the evolution of these viruses is that in spite of the fact that HTLV1 and HTLV2 are pathogenic and their pathology is very aggressive and not treatable, only a tiny minority of the people infected with HTLV develop disease, no more than 1 to 3 percent of the people infected. Whereas, for example, in the case of uh, HIV, uh, HIV not only is extremely pathogenic, but virtually every single person infected by HIV, whether in a short term or in a longer term, sooner or later, will develop immunodeficiency if not treated with antiretroviral therapy. On the other hand, simian Fuami viruses are, for what we know right now, absolutely non-pathogenic, and they seem to coexist with their host in a uh, rather benign way. Okay, this is the distribution of HDLVs. They are distributed in uh, all over the world. And uh, as I said at the beginning, especially HDLV uh, uh, can be found either in endemically infected uh, uh, Native American tribes and also pygmy tribes in Africa, but also in a large proportion in injected drug users around the world. Uh, HDLV1 as well. There is a, a subtype that is called the cosmopolitan subtype that is present all over the world. Other subtypes uh, can only be found either in Central Africa or in remote area of Southeast Asia. Uh, some of them are only found in Central Africa in pygmy tribes. Um, STLV also, they are the senior counterpart of these viruses, have been isolated pretty much by many, if not almost all, of the old world monkeys. Uh, and probably they can have very high seroprevalence in the wild. They have been isolated from macaques, from orangutan, monobus, chimpanzees, uh, sudimangabis, uh, and uh, even from actually macaques, which are in Asia. So they have been isolated both from African and Asian monkeys. STLV2 has been isolated so far um, only from African monkeys, and STLV3 has been found in uh, um, right now, so far, just in an African babu. So, uh, that's why we collectively call them primate lipotropic viruses, because they're pretty much ubiquitous in humans and in a lot of different monkey species. Similar situation to what we have seen for uh, uh, simian fungal viruses. However, when uh, we start now looking at the uh, uh, phylogeny in a little bit more detail, then the PTLB phylogeny actually appears very, very different from uh, the one that we have seen for simian Fuami viruses. Well, this is a, a, a representative uh, a PTLB tree that includes all the major PTLB1 types. So PTLB1, which includes HTLB1 and STLB1s, PTLB2, which includes HTLB2 and simian STLB2s here, PTLB4 and PTLB3 and PTLB5. Now, one thing that you can see here is that, and you will see a little bit more in detail in the next slides, is, for example, in case of PTLV2, there seems to be two clearly distinct lineages. One that leads to the semen T lymphotropic viruses uh, found in pygmy chimpanzees, and one are the HTLV2 isolated in humans. On the other hand, for the primate T lymphotropic viruses, human and semen lineages are pretty much intermixed. So there seems not to be strong evidence of co-speciation in these viruses. And that's, in fact, uh, um, one of the characteristics typical of these viruses is, in fact, their ability to be zoonotically transmitted. If we look a little bit more in detail at the, uh, you know, at the primate lymphotropic virus uh, tree, which includes um, simian T lymphotropic viruses isolated from different 
species, uh, Asian and African monkeys, as well uh, viruses isolated from uh, uh, different human hosts, uh, we can see that there are specific clades that are usually classified as uh, PTLD subtypes. For example, there is the HTL1B uh, Central African subtype. This is a clade that includes only sequences isolated from uh, humans living infected with HTLV1 and living in Central Africa, and also from uh, uh, also includes some STLVs isolated from uh, chimpanzees also living in Central Africa. So the same true is true, for example, for the 1D Cameroonian subtype, for the Melanesian subtypes. So essentially, this group is telling us that there are different subtypes of PTLV, uh, specifically. Um, um, relating viruses in uh, human and simian viruses in specific living in specific geographic areas. Uh, this seems to be really the hallmark of continuous zoonotic transmission or continuous transmission from human to man uh, from monkeys to humans and uh, sometimes maybe even the opposite. Um, so um, we attempted calibrate the molecular clock of these viruses. And uh, the way we uh, uh, did this was actually using some interesting pattern that could be observed in, uh, in the actual phylogenetic tree. Let me go back for a second to the previous slide. Okay. In this Asian part of the tree, we can clearly see that there is a monophyletic group of viruses, and this is HTLV1C from actually uh, uh, Melanesia and Australian uh, Aboriginal populations. So this was HTL1C that essentially was uh, um, isolated from uh, uh, people living in um, um, Melanesia tribes. Uh, this actual clade, which is very well supported, uh, share a common ancestor with a clade including uh, STLV, senior chelimpotropic viruses, isolated from actually uh, different uh, macaques species, especially macaque tonkeana, living in Indonesia. Now, what is interesting is that uh, there are no macaques living in, uh, in Australia, actually, and that, that according to anthropological and um, historical and then, uh, archaeological data, uh, the settling of Australia probably from Indonesia, this, the human settling, probably happened between 50 and 60,000 years ago. That was the day when actually humans migrated for the first time from Indonesia and started settling uh, Melanesia. So the finding of HTLV in uh, Aboriginal tribes in Australia and the correlation in the tree of this HTLV-1 and the STLV-1 in the macaques that live in Indonesia but are not present in the Australian continent let, seems to suggest that uh, uh, probably the virus was brought by the, the humans that settled Melanesia 50,000 years ago from Indonesia. So probably our ancestor acquired the infection in Indonesia uh, by contact with monkeys back then. And as soon after and after the migration from Indonesia, in fact, uh, to Australia, and so the physical separation between the human population and the monkeys infected, uh, uh, this lineage of HTLV1 started drifting apart. So we can use this node of the tree to calibrate the clock, assuming that this node is at least 50, 60,000 years ago. It might have been, of course, earlier than that, but not later, because after that, the migration had already occurred. So if we use, actually, the migration and the settling of Australia as a calibration of uh, uh, the molecular clock, um, we can actually mm, estimate that overall, uh, the rate of these uh, uh, viruses, the rate of evolution of these viruses is around 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6, looking per substitution per site per year. We can also calibrate um, an evolutionary clock for uh, a PTLB2 for the primate uh, uh viruses. Uh, because also in the PTLB2 viruses, we have a, a, a similar interesting distinction. There is basically a, a monophyletic lineage that eventually joins together. Uh, STLV2, senior chimpanzee viruses, isolated from pantroglobitis, from pygmy chimpanzees living in Central Africa. Uh, and uh, and uh, the branch that is the closest related with the senior lineage is actually the HTLV branch that leads to the HTLV2, an HTLV2 isolated, that has been isolated from uh, African pygmy populations, living again in the same 
geographic area. Uh, in turn, the, the HTLV2 in pygmy is separated from the HTLV2 that is now uh, um, spreading all over the world. And, uh, and also the HTLV2 that is today present in uh, an infected Native uh, American uh, uh, tribes. So the idea is that this node, which is the separation between the African pygmy related HTLV2 and the uh, Native American HTLV2, Yes. To wrap it up, yeah, 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 of course, of course. So very quickly, let me tell you, so this calibration node is probably around, uh, uh, it might have been probably happening around 80 to 100,000 years ago at the time of the exodus of out of Africa migration when uh, African pygmy population eventually got separated. So. By wrapping up and calibrating the clock and essentially coming up with some analysis, what we can see is that this virus is probably all HTLVs shared a common ancestor between 200 and 400,000 years ago. So it definitely are all viruses and uh, although much younger, the simian foamy viruses. The evolutionary rate, when we cal calibrate the evolutionary rate um, for the HTLV2, for example, infecting uh, endemic tribes, we find that there's about 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7 nuclear acid substitution per year. But when we try to do the same calibration in HTLV2 infecting drug users, we find actually that the rate is much, much faster. The reason why we think there is this huge difference is because of actually infection rate. Uh, we have shown many years ago that essentially the main difference between HTLV2 infecting uh, uh, endemically population and infecting injected drug users is in, the, in drug users, the virus is spread much more, much faster because of uh, needle sharing among different drug users. At every uh, a new infection, there is a chance for the virus to replicate, therefore to introduce and accumulate mutations, whereas virus in endemic population usually, uh, uh, as soon as it infects a new host, for example, a child, from uh, a mother, the replica is just for a few cycles and then it becomes dormant. So basically the virus has much less chances to mutate in uh, injecting drug users than it has when it's spreading vertically from mother to child. And this accounts for the wild different replication rate. Now I don't have time too much to go to HIV, but it's probably known by everybody that HIV on the other hand is a much more recent history. Again, we're talking about zoonotic transmission, like in case of HTLVs. But now we're talking about an epidemic that probably has been spreading in humans only within the last 100 years. A virus that is replicating much, much faster and also that recombines very, very quickly. So let me give you uh, some conclusions here. Um, what can we say in general of all the different retroviruses? That in general, they have little or no homology, especially when we consider retroviruses belonging to different genera. That they have widely different evolution rates and time scale that are usually related to their mode of transmission, replication rate in the host, and so forth. They have very different evolutionary patterns, co-speciation within us for simian foamy viruses, ancient zoonotic transmission and early zoonotic transfer for PTLBs, recent zoonotic transmission, and early zoonotic transfer for HIV SAD. Uh, some of them absolutely do not go uh, undergo recombination. HIV, SIV does, in fact, very frequently. And for all these reasons, uh, try to put them together and in one single coherent uh, 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 phylogeny is actually very challenging. And uh, especially because, you know, they're not, homology probably has been lost. So uh, it's, uh, it probably makes much more sense to study this virus, each species separately, and then try to um, uh, rejoin them in, in the tree of life, uh, comparing different trees that are partially overlapping using super tree kind of approaches. Uh, taxonomic classification based on genome structure or strictly bifurcating trees might not be related to actual evolutionary history at all for all these reasons, and especially for the presence of frequent recombination. Uh, the last slide I want to show you is about this uh, time frame. So there is an interesting pattern that emerged when we studied these retroviruses. We go from simian foamy viruses that have been probably co-evolving with the host for millions of years that is completely non-pathogenic. Uh, we have simian T-cell lipotropic viruses also 
evolving with the host at least. Well, also not co-evolving with the host, but evolving within monkeys probably for the past 500,000 years, also non pathogenic. HTLVs have a much more recent origin. They have been transmitted from monkeys to humans within the past 5,000 years, and they are mildly pathogenic. Remember what I said at the beginning, 1% to 3% of people infected with HTLV are actually uh, um, uh, develop actually diseases. And finally, we have 20th century retroviruses like HIV that just uh, in the past uh, 100 years jumped into our species and they are extremely pathogenic. Uh, so there seems to be a trend between the, the time that has that particular uh, retrovirus has been evolving within a host and its pathogenicity and inverse correlation, which is maybe expected. And the real interesting question, evolutionary speaking, is since all these retroviruses seems also to be to have some homology, at least in terms of genome organization and reverse transcriptase with endogenous retroviruses, uh, the two potential hypotheses for their general origin is that either retroviruses originated from retrotransposones, so somehow the endogenous retroviruses were the original ancestor, and eventually some of these endogenous retroviruses acquired the ability to be transferred horizontally, so somehow escaped from the genome. Or maybe it's exactly the opposite. Maybe uh, retroviruses are just among the ancient, most ancient objects that uh, we know, maybe a relic of the RNA world that eventually uh, uh, split in endogenous retrovirus and um, uh, exogenous retroviruses. I have no answer. I mean, this is uh, uh, completely, this, the questions in these slides are completely open questions. Um, but uh, definitely interesting questions, and this is one of the reasons why, as I said at the beginning, these objects uh, are very interesting to a, a very interesting object of study uh, from the point of view of evolutionary theory.